okay, I think we're ready. Don't, don't do that. Everybody act completely different. We're starting, right? Don't do that. Are we good, Josh? Okay. Well, I'm glad to be here with you guys for the second week of the early church, church history TBI class, week two out of three. You're already halfway done. Hopefully you guys uh, did your homework. You guys uh, joining us on YouTube, welcome. Hopefully you guys did your homework too. So uh, there was no homework. So uh, no, there was a little bit. We're going to get to it in a second. But let me pray for us to open us tonight. Father, we thank you for this time that we can come together and study not only your word, but also about your son who died for us and rose again and lives today. Lord, we pray that you would be glorified as we study. We pray that we would be humble. We would be teachable. We would be listening for what you have to teach us tonight. Lord, and that this wouldn't be just an academic exercise, but that it would be life-changing. Lord, that we would become more like your son, Jesus. And we pray that the Spirit would do that work in us tonight. May you receive all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was told to go down a number of slides, so we're down to 61 this week. So hopefully you're caffeinated. You should have a white handout that is the outline for tonight's class, the one page, and then you have a packet of handouts that I'm going to address at the end. So, or if you get bored, it gives you something to read. And for those of you that are watching online, you can uh, email me at john at wildwoodchurch.org, and I can send you those. We'll also put you in the My Wildwood group where you'll get the, those via email as well for next week. Um, we're going to start off with something we looked at last week, and that was why should we even be doing this? Why should we study church history? Uh, well, we study church history for a very important reason. We see God's faithfulness. We see his power, his guidance, his care, as he not only maintains the church throughout history, but as he works in people's lives, right? As, he, as we see the Word of God go throughout the world and maintain um, its accuracy, as we see uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ who lived before us go through struggles, seek to enunciate what they believed and write some of those things down, there's lots of reasons uh, but it will expand your faith dramatically as you study church history. Um, I've given you uh, last week, and I'll show you again this week, the, the books that I recommend. There, there's four of them over there on the, I don't know what that is, a step uh, to, that you can look through and see which ones you want to read if you want to read some more about church history. But you did have homework, and your homework was to think about what we talked about last time and come up with two or three things that really had an impact on you. That you thought, wow, that, that's really phenomenal that God did that, or that, that intersects with my faith in this way. And I just wanted to ask if anyone wanted to, to share that. Anything that stood out to you last week? We okay back there with this, Josh? Okay. No pressure. Just a microphone day at you guys. Anybody? Think about what, what we talked about last week. Polycarp was really interesting. Yeah. What stood out about that? Um, probably his time in the arena and mm -hmm. just his martyrdom there. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal, yeah. right? Another thing that stood out to me about it was just that he knew John, yeah. that we have a lineage back to the Apostle John through him. Uh, and then as we study uh, Irenaeus, we see he knew Polycarp. So there's another person you can read about in that secession. Roger. That's the same thing, just the linkage that goes all the way back. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, we study the, you know, the biblical record, you know, through Acts, and then, you know, we're pretty familiar with what's going on now. But just that, that gap, that huge gap in time, to mm -hmm. understand that there's a linkage that goes all the way back. That's right. That's right. Um, the great news is there's not a gap. We have writings all the way back, and we have people, and we have eyewitness accounts, and we have non-Christian accounts. And so uh, to open up the world of the last 2,000 years is a pretty daunting but encouraging thing, right? Um, anyone else want to share? Keith. The, uh, today, in our country, uh, the term and the... Uh, 
infrastructure is a big deal, right? Everybody wants to spend a ton of money on infrastructure, right? So you think about the infrastructure of the Roman Empire, okay? Mm -hmm. I think you said 50,000 miles of roads or something like that. And then they also had a great uh, navigation, a tremendous navigation for trade purposes, okay? Mm -hmm. So they were all over, whatever you needed, they would deliver it and the information and going back and forth and so on and so forth. And that enabled, so it wasn't just like, that's part of the plan of God, mm -hmm. okay? And it even says that in the course of time, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. So time. today, I was thinking about this. We want to do a broadband internet throughout the country, even to the areas where it may not be available at the present time, mm -hmm. okay? So that's infrastructure, mm -hmm. okay? And I've been struck by this. I don't know how many people have watched The Chosen, which is the series that's ongoing. Mm -hmm. It's very realistic. It brings things into a very understandable, uh, believable approach mm -hmm. of personality of all the people, and et cetera. I said, that's, that's, how, that's how the gospel is going to be given to the whole world, mm -hmm. which is a command, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's right. It's not, we're not, the Lord's not going to back and tell the whole world has been exposed to the gospel. So tell me, is there a better way than a popular, readily acceptable, on video, on the internet, through right. satellites, touching every country and anybody that's got an electronic device anywhere in the world to get the message right. okay that's great that, and that's infrastructure right so that's right that's a great i yep. mean that's a great point that's what Lori was Lori was commenting on that last week yep. on you know when we look around and we see things that might be used for evil how god can use them for good right uh, network of satellites hovering over the earth to deliver that internet also right and so we can see how, how can we use that you know there is one other better way i think than that and that is that romans 10 way that we talked about and that's you guys uh, but how you guys do that, it doesn't say. So it might be using technology like that. So I, I want to do a little bit of a pop quiz from last week. And again, we won't spend much time doing this. Here are some terms. I deleted a term because I had one extra and it didn't make two columns, and that term was turkey. I thought, some of y'all got turkey so well. But other than that, right, Greek Empire, Roman Empire, right, um, syncretism, right, the blending of different religions into into allowable and one in the Roman Empire, all those emperors we looked at, uh, the peace of Rome. Remember all these? If not, we're going to go over them again. Remember, that's how class works, uh, right? Uh, Acts 1-8 that Mark talked about also that they would go locally and then they'd go throughout the world. We looked at Nero and what happened in the great Jewish revolt, 64, then 66 through 70 AD. We looked at the destruction of Jerusalem, Right? Uh, what it meant for a apostolic faith, a faith going back to the apostles, and we're going to look at that a little bit more tonight. Uh, we saw the historian Josephus, and then, again, uh, many bad fish with Polycarp and his, uh, his martyrdom, but also that we had a work written about him. So I got a compliment on that from someone on YouTube. That's why I have to keep saying the joke. We also saw the Roman Empire... Uh, as the area that we were located in, I think I confused you guys a little bit on the timing as I jumped back and forth, but at least we got the place right. So remember on here, if you can leave the class with some geography, that would be good. So again, where's Turkey? Turkey on our map here is green and purple split where it says Galatia. Just to the left of that is where it says Macedonia. What is that today? Greece and the big boot, Italy, right? And then you see just a little strip down there of green that has Jerusalem in it. So that's the area that we are. The gospel is going to continue to spread around the world, uh, both through what you see there as Egypt and then also through uh, North Africa. Okay, remember our, our study is about from 64 AD to 313 AD, and then immediately we went back to 33 AD. So it got a little confusing, but that's okay. Um, here's where we are with the churches of that area. Remember this last week? Got this? Too fast, too slow. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, how we divide up church history. Uh, Dr. Hannah from Dallas Seminary divides it up this way. 
And the reason he does is, that he, you know, it's sort of the pastoral writing of those earliest church fathers. You can divide this up, you know, sort of however you want based on the writings in your packet if you want to come up with your own plan. Uh, some people will put them before and after uh, the Nicene Council, uh, but he does it based sort of on what they were like and what they wrote. Um, so today, again, we're going to start back in 33, but what we're going to look at mainly today is the year 100 to 200 A.D., 100 to 200. But what I want to do is say, what was, what was church like back then? What were believers like? What did they do? When did they come together, right? What did it look like? So we know from Acts chapter 2, right, remember this? what the Christians were doing after Jesus' resurrection after Pentecost. It says that the first Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayers. Okay, so the apostles' teaching. That normally refers to the Gospels, right, or those accounts. Again, things weren't necessarily all written at that time. We're going to see the four Gospels uh, come into play really early. But it says to the apostles' teaching, not to other teaching. Right? It says that they who believed were together. I love that. They were together. They had all things in common. Uh, they were selling their possessions. Uh, and it says, day by day, they attended temple together, broke bread in their homes. Right? Um, so there is this, we are together. We meet together daily. We meet together weekly that the early church had. Okay? Um, here it is in bullet points. Right? Apostles teaching fellowship, breaking of bread, they were together. It's a hard thing for us to feel, not only in a COVID environment, but also in a spread out environment, right? Oklahoma City at one point was, I think it's 10th now, but it was the largest city in the world by land size. Pretty remarkable fact that you'll never use again, but that's pretty remarkable, right? Even Norman annexes all the way to Lake Thunderbird and adds nine miles worth of Norman. It's a spread out place, right? Those of you that have homes, sometimes if you can do it, you drive up and pull into your garage and shut the garage door, right? You're not necessarily a together people. We have to work at being together. It was something they valued, right? Uh, Galatians 3 says even more about the, who the people were in the church. It says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Again, Keith was talking about when we started this morning how revolutionary this was, right? Uh, to a people that have been called the called out people if you were a Jew, or to a woman who didn't have status in that culture, right? Or whatever this might have been, to a slave, right? Even one when we see a writing to Onesimus, right? To a slave, it says, you are, they are one in Christ Jesus. So that's 33 AD, and you may be really familiar with that. Here's the cool thing. We're going to jump ahead to 155 A.D., okay, 155 A.D. So we're moving ahead 120 years, okay, 155 A.D., what was church like? Well, we know, we have the writings, okay? I love this quote by Gonzalez. He says, every Sunday was a sort of Easter and a day of joy. Every Friday was a day of penance, fasting, and sorrow, okay, so sort of what your week looked like. Um, we know they also actually fasted on the Jewish fast day of Wednesday also. But uh, remember, Sunday is a, a day of resurrection, of new birth, of joy, but there was also this day of fasting in their week. Okay? Uh, they gathered on the first day of the week uh, to symbolize the resurrection as different from the Jewish Sabbath. Uh, they celebrated his resurrection. We talked about this last week. Not as much uh, the death until later. Uh, they celebrated the resurrection of Jesus uh, we, and they celebrated communion. So a big part of their gathering together was communion, right? Even remember, it, was, it consisted of a meal until they started messing it up, right? So 1 Corinthians 11, when you take communion and it says, this, he, just, he describes communion, it starts with, the reason I'm having to tell you this is y'all are all messing it up. Like some of you are eating, some of you are not eating because it was associated with a meal also, right? So in, in the early church, they took it as a meal, but communion was a big deal. It was even called a communion service, not a worship service in that sense. There was two parts to this service. All right, there's the first part, um, which so everybody, I want to get this straight, um, even non-baptized people could come to this, consisted of scripture reading and commentary. Why don't you look at this? Scripture reading, commentary, prayers, 
and the singing of hymns. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Right? This is a long time ago. Then they, they dismissed the non-baptized at that time, and they celebrated communion. Uh, and that consisted of several things. This kiss of peace, right? That's either four or five times in your New Testament, right? A greeting time. Uh, so those of you that say, I'm an introvert, I don't like the greeting time. Hey, they did it back then. We should probably bring it back in the church, right? Um, they, they had the kiss of peace. They, they prayed over the elements. They took the bread and the cup, and they had a closing benediction. Um, you could almost write this about a church today, right? It sounds really familiar. But what I want to do is look back at where did we get this information? Because what I want to spur you on to do through this course also is to read the original documents yourself. They are out there, C-C-E-L, C-C-E-L.org, and I have it on a slide later at the end, is a place where you can read these original works, right? Um, Someone calls, what are you doing? I'm reading the Anti-Nicene Church Fathers. Okay, good, good. Well, we're going to play putt-putt, right? We're going to learn about a guy. Who was it? His name was Justin. His name wasn't actually Justin Martyr. His name was Justin. Justin was born in a Roman city in modern-day, what would be modern-day Israel, okay, the area of Samaria. Um, Obviously, you know, that's a pen and ink. We don't really have good pictures of him, so did he have the beard or not? We don't know. Um, he might be going a little bit Duck Dynasty on us in that picture, but he was born to pagan parents. And his, so his parents weren't believers, and so he, his parents arranged for him to have teachers. He had a teacher who was a Stoic. You may have heard that term. We talked about a little bit about Socrates and Plato last week. He had a teacher who was a Stoic. He had a teacher um, who wanted to teach him math with Pythagoras. He had a teacher who was Platonic, right, after Plato. None of this satisfied him. He knew there was something deeper. Uh, about 130, if you look on his, his timeline there, it's about when he's about 30 years old, we have a story of him conversing with an old man. And we think that's when he came to faith. But he's going to combine his faith with philosophy and as a sort of this theology of the word that will come through Justin that will be a link between philosophy and Christians. Um, he moves to Rome. He actually goes there twice. He, he founds at least one school there um, and writes and teaches. Then you'll see there that last bullet point gave a little bit of it away, but he is, he is martyred for his faith in 165. Uh, we have his writings, especially these first and second apology, okay, these writings that he wrote to the emperor, again, talking about Christianity and why Christianity is a valid way to believe. Okay, and inside those writings we have the description of what the early church did when they met. Okay? Here's what we have. On the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together to one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read, as long as time permits. Then when the reader has ceased, Mark's going to love the president verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. Okay, so we guess we call Mark the president. I don't know. Right? So what happens? Again, here it is. Here's where we get this. They meet on Sunday. They gather in one place, and it says that the writings of the prophets or of the apostles are read. Then, when the reader has ceased reading these publicly, uh, the person in charge, later we're going to see them move into what's called a, a bishop or um, a different term for a leader. Right? But the leader, look at what he instructs. He exhorts to the imitation of these good things. Life change. They don't just read the Scripture. He says, here's how we should become, here's how we should act and grow in our faith. Okay, it's sort of a sermon, right? Um, He says, then we all rise together and pray. As we before said, when our prayer is ended, bread and wine and water are brought, and the president offers prayers, thanksgiving, according to his ability, and the people assent, saying, Amen. He even added there, I think, in one, uh, he says it means, so be it. There's a distribution to each and a participation of that over which the thanks have been given. Okay? He mentions deacons. He says those that are absent, a portion is sent by the deacons. They're taking care of the people that can't come. It says those who are well-to-do and willing give what each thinks fit. Sounds biblical, right, as you have decided in your own mind. What is collected is deposited with the president who gives it to the orphans and the widows and those who 
through sickness or any other cause are in want, and uh, those who are in bonds and the strangers among us, right? So there is this, we gather the money, we give an offering, and that offering is then dispersed to those who are in need. Sounds a lot like what was going on 120 years before that, right? Afterward, we continually remind each other of these things. The wealthy help the needy. We keep together. For all things we are supplied. He says, we bless the maker of all through his son, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Ghost. Right? That's remarkable. We have that. That's what they did. They were together, and it was a priority. And they studied God's word, and they looked to live it out, and they looked to give praise, and they gave prayer. Right? He talks about the taking of communion. He says this Eucharist, this remembrance, it says, no one is allowed to partake but the man who believes that the things which we teach are true. Okay, we say that when we give communion here, right? If you are a believer, you're welcome to take of communion. We're not asking uh, what denomination you come from. Just if, if you're identifying with Christ as your Savior, you can take communion. That's what they did. He says, he who has been washed with the washing that is for the remission of sins and unto regeneration, and who is living as Christ has enjoyed, right? Living is important. And we're going to talk about that washing for remission of sins in just a second, so hold on to that if you caught that, right? Um, daunting slide. Don't, don't get daunted. We're not going to read this whole one, right? He also talks about what happens after somebody uh, is baptized on Easter. And I just put the slide in there so that you can read it later. But again, it sounds a lot. It's, it's how they take their first communion, right? And we know that that, that first communion... Uh, was very special to them after they were baptized. We'll talk about baptism here in a minute. Um, sometimes thou shalt had not only bread and wine, but water, symbolizing their cleansing. Some places even had um, milk and honey, symbolizing coming into a new land because they were a believer now. Okay, um, okay, that's a lot of text and a lot of things up there. I, I, I want to go a different direction. Um, blurry picture, you're not allowed to take pictures in the catacombs. Um, the catacombs. So I want to talk a little bit about some things that you hear. You think early church, right? They were pressed down there. They couldn't worship. They were, you know, they were getting beaten and killed. And so Lori and I go to the catacombs. That's not the case, right? Didn't know it till we showed up. Maybe you knew all the history. I, I didn't know that was the case. Um, funny aside, we started going to the catacombs. Look who we went with. Is that not funny? It's like, hey, Lori, let's go down with them. I had met him at our church in Dallas before, but you know, he had no clue who we were, but we got a selfie. So in, in Rome, there's 40 to 50 sets of catacombs. The Christians, that, let's get off that slide. The Christians there went there uh, to worship, and there was a tie to martyrs, to the dead that had gone before them. They would sing, right? Land was very, very expensive. They didn't have the land within Rome, and Rome didn't want you to bury your dead inside the city walls, so they went underneath to bury, okay? Uh, one thing that they did, though, they, they worshiped. So those of you that think, I could worship better singing in the bathroom, that's probably what it sounded like. You would have been great then, right? Um, here's a little fun quiz. On the walls of the catacombs, uh, some of our first Christian art from the second century, right? Tell me what you see. It's not trick. What do you think? Jesus the Good Shepherd. Man, I wish I had something to give you. I don't have anything. Okay? What about this one? It's not Wizard of Oz. What do you think that is? It is. Say it. Yeah. Right? Remember, your second to fourth century. What's this one? Hmm? Ah, someone said it. Someone who draws poorly identifies with the poor drawing, right? That's the ark. There's the picture. She, the bird gives it away, right? Here's one. Who's this? Remember, these are actual pictures. Right. I didn't know. I mean, that's a little scary. It's got teeth and ear things, but, right? So these are there. So I want to ask the question. I'll bring it up to a little bit more to modern day. Why do you think they put pictures on the catacomb walls? Yeah. To remember, right? To remember and to pass on some of those, maybe those biblical events that they didn't have written down. But if you were singing uh, on a certain day of worship in the catacombs and you saw drawings around you that weren't submarines, a little bit doesn't work well in here, but, <laughs> right? You would think of 
right? What the Greek Orthodox later in church history would say is the gospel in art. The Greek Orthodox are then going to decorate everything with icons um, to bring you into um, a worshipful experience of the Lord, right? Um, should churches do that? Should they not? It's going to be a debate throughout the centuries, right? Should we use art or is it an idol? Um, that picture there is, that's actually First Christian Church lot in Oklahoma where I grew up. I sat in those pews many a Sunday looking at the stained glass windows and um, having a little bit of, possibly having some ADHD, um, seeing the figures that were in the scriptures when I got bored and looked around, right? Obviously, I'm a fan um, of churches. Uh, our churches have changed. Now we use multimedia. Now we don't have windows. We don't need light in. We don't have, we use buildings that weren't built for this, right? So it's different. I get that. But just something to think about. There was art in the catacombs, okay? Here's another thing to think about. There's no more catacombs. What about this? Churches and cemeteries together, okay? Let's just say you were walking into church and there was a cemetery around Wildwood, okay? Um, this verse always comes to mind. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, right? What do you see when you walk into church to worship? Tombstones. What, what do those represent? What's there? Yeah, your family members, your, your other family members, people that, that were saints that were buried there, Christians that were, went before you. So you go in for Sunday worship, um, you realize my life is short, right? My, uh, the things that I'm worried about in our church building probably aren't that important, right? Um, we are with our brothers and sisters who have gone before us, the great cloud of witnesses, right? Um, yeah, neat aside, that's Lower Marion Baptist Church. That's where my great grandfather and my grand, my great great grandfather and my great grandfather are buried. So um, it's also where Kobe Bryant went to high school. So that's probably where I got it, right? No. So that's actually the church that they walked. They would have walked into um, and seen the people that had gone before them. Just trying to get you thinking of how different it is living in sort of a sterile world that we live in, right? Okay. Let's keep going. I want to talk about one more uh, part of that worship service, and that was baptism and the Christian life. Okay? Your baptism happened at Easter. And remember, some of these things are progressing. They don't happen the same way well, in this time period to 100 years later. There's a progression. And as, as baptism progressed, it became a longer period of time between when you believed and when you were baptized, simply because Gentiles were coming into the church who had no history. They didn't understand. They, they didn't know the, the truth. And so that big word there, meaning one who is questioned, Right? It says that there's a time of fasting and penance before Easter. Right? But then the person who was going to be baptized uh, had a time of preparation, a time of trial, instruction, and doctrine, uh, seeing if there were signs in their daily life of the depth of their conviction. Um, you know, we talk about this. We meet with everyone here who's going to be baptized just to make sure that people understand the gospel. We want to make sure that there's not something that you've learned from Hey, in that case, maybe Jewish culture or something where we were baptized, but it was for something different. But we do this. We, we want to talk to them. And it's funny because we think, is that okay that we do that for like 30 minutes, right? Um, could be three years, so you got it easy, right? They were baptized at Easter, and they, it was done in certain ways. Um, the, the, the church fathers talk about it being um, either immersion or a kneeling in water with pouring, they weren't as hung up on this as we were, right, <laughs> trying to figure this out. But there was definitely um, an immersion or a, a pouring over the head. Some people did it three times based on um, the Trinity, things like that. Um, again, it was done usually without clothing, and then you were given a white robe to put on. Um, so guys, girls, there was, you know, we weren't, you know, it's okay. But symbolizing your birth, your new birth as you come out of the water, and then you being washed white and putting on this robe, right? Then you would take your first communion. It also symbolized, as, as the sacraments do, they're a little more complicated and complex and connected than we want to make them now, right? So it symbolized your entrance into the church, lower C, the body of believers. Um, the shepherd of Hermas wrote that it was 
uh, an assurance seen as a seal of the forgiveness of sins. And, and remember, as people teach and as they write and as they celebrate, uh, we don't believe that history is something that is infallible or given by God the way that they did it, right? So certain people did certain things in an unbiblical way. So we're not saying, hey, this is the way you should do it because this person did it this way or they taught right. There's a lot of people that teach wrongly as well, okay? Um, but again, I put on there one inseparable, <laughs> it sounds like one shining moment, one inseparable moment, meaning there was a strong tie in the way they believed to this baptism being the, I don't want to use the wrong word here, um, connected to their salvation, Right? And you think, oh, I've been to Church of Christ Church, and they teach, or even a disciple of Christ Church, baptismal regeneration. Right? When you read some of the church fathers, there's a connection, but it's not necessarily in the way that it is taught today. It was tied together, but it's just harder to understand what they're saying. Right? I became a believer in a church baptism class in that environment when I was eight years old because there was such a tie to explaining baptism and the gospel. Right? Again, um, faith in Christ... Dr. Hannah from Seminary says, a commitment to Christ preceded the sacrament, but the way they speak about it is different. We have a, a creed that was uh, recited during these worship services, especially baptism and Easter, that is before the Nicene Creed, and it's usually just symbolized with a large R, and it means the, it's called the Old Roman symbol or the, the R creed, and this is that creed. And you'll recognize as we move into what the Nicene Creed has in it, um, some of the things are in there, some of them are not. And remember, creeds and councils are usually in response to something that's happening um, with heresy around them. But look at what it says. I believe in God the Father Almighty and in Christ Jesus, His only begotten Son. Our Lord, who was born of the Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mary, who under Pontius Pilate was crucified and buried, the third day rose from the dead, ascended into the heavens. You know all these things, right? Well, just hold on. Right? It's about to get a little bit crazy as we talk about why they had to say these things. And then we're going we're gonna to actually say this together to end tonight. Um, what I want to do is give you guys, we really are. Um, okay, it's time to have a 30-second stand-up and stretch break. So stand up. Remember, they can hear you on YouTube. You're welcome to talk to our YouTubers if you guys want to do your influencing. Now, stretch. If we have nothing to there you go. Wake up. Woo! Okay, that was 30 minutes. Pretty good of your three years before you get baptized. Okay, we'll keep going. I want to shift gears from how did the early church uh, worship when they came together? How did they gather? What did it look like? Um, but I want you to continually think of what does that mean for me in my life? Am I together with other believers? Right? Am, am, I, am I making that a priority at least once or twice a week? Um, even more so how you can communicate even when you're not around, talking about technology, right? So, but I want to shift gears. I want to shift gears. So um, I want to shift into uh, a definition here of orthodoxy and what it means to be a heretic. Hard turn right or left, I don't know, right? Um, th this term may have a certain uh, belief in your mind, but when we say the term orthodoxy, we are simply saying uh, connected back to the original apostles and Jesus' beliefs, but it's correct in biblical belief and practice embraced by the church. Okay, just hold on to that definition. Correct in biblical belief and practice embraced by the church. Shelley says, much of orthodoxy was articulated, I should have tried to read this first, because some heresy had arisen that threatened to change the nature of Christianity and to destroy its central faith. Okay, so the believers gather together, there are certain things that the apostles teach, that the disciples taught, that other people are saying aren't true. So they gather together and in a very fluid environment, say these are the core beliefs of what the four Gospels say, right? And that's what we would consider would be orthodox, and they're going to continually define that, right? So when we say a heretic or heresy, we're saying someone who teaches unorthodox, unbiblical theology and practice. And this isn't an easy delineation with some of the people in church history because certain people say things that we would consider biblical and orthodox, and then they say this over here. And so, you know, it's, it's not a hard and fast line, but what we're about to talk about in, the, in this person's life it was, right? Uh, Shelley describes this. He says, theology 
remember that our study of God is not synonymous with God's revelation itself. Theology is the human understanding of revelation and the effort to express it clearly in teaching and preaching. Okay, I'm going to hold that slide up there for a second so you can sort of chew on this. What does it mean? It means our understanding and the words that we use to talk about God, given our language and trying to be accurate, is still not inspired. It is our, still our effort. So keep that in mind. And I want to go into a certain heresy that was affecting the early church, one that you may have heard of, Gnosticism. Okay, now, Gnosticism is actually a term meaning a grouping of different belief systems that had Gnostic thought and practice then. So there was, there was different ones. But overall, um, as look at that I put on there as early as mid-first century. I'm going to try and prove that to you in just a minute. Um, gnosis meant knowledge. So Gnostic thought was that there was a special, mystical, secret knowledge beyond the Scriptures that could liberate you. There's a dualism seen, again, out of our Greek Hellenistic worldview uh, that the spiritual is good, the physical is bad right? And your salvation would then be liberation from the, the evil physical world. Just hold on. You don't have to understand this completely to, to see where we're going to go with this, right? The chief identifying characteristic of Gnosticism is, as the name itself suggests, the idea that salvation is primarily a matter of acquiring esoteric knowledge, a form of enlightenment. Your wisdom, your learning, your gnosis considered knowing both the true nature of the universe and the truth about the Gnostic's real identity but look at this last line. The Gnostic was thus part of a spiritual elite, superior to other men. If you want to know how it functioned, you know, if you've ever tried to describe um, possibly the religious pinnings of Tom Cruise and that movement, it's a lot like trying to describe this. It's difficult because it doesn't sound like the words that we use. Um, Gnostic thought, and especially uh, Marcion later, is going to say that there is a different God than the one in the Bible. There is a perfect God who is just spirit, but that the God of the Bible actually came from an emanation of wisdom that came out of the original true good God. And that Jewish God is called the Demiurge. Okay? Uh, that bad Jewish God created the world, this physical place, and gave birth to the people in it. Okay? Just hang tight. This is going somewhere. Okay? Okay, well, that's, that's sort of strange, right? Um, this movement denies creation, denies the incarnation of Christ, his crucifixion, his resurrection. Um, and as we see these movements, I'm going to tell you there's nothing new under the sun. And what, when an older person says that, we're, we're quoting, don't worry about it. What it means is it's what goes around is going to come around again. So this has, this has a lot to do with our modern world. Does it matter today? Well, I say modern. Let's try 15 years ago, right? Um, didn't see the movie, but The Da Vinci Code. Anyone remember this? Right? And the firestorm this caused in Christian circles as well, right? Uh, Dan Brown really believed, and he gave interviews saying that the Gnostic writings that were found at Nag Hammadi in 1945 uh, gave us a fifth gospel came out of the Jesus Seminar movement years before, but that um, as his character in his book learned these secret truths, he learned more about Jesus and who Jesus was and wasn't, and it was hidden through paintings, it was hidden through history, there was a deeper knowledge. Um, it was exactly Gnosticism, right, even referring to some of the, the writings. Um, Alan Branch, who's a professor at, at I believe, at Midwestern, said, Gnosticism is back. The overwhelming biblical illiteracy that pervades our society will make people more susceptible to its claims. Get that? Biblical illiteracy. In contrast to the supposed secret of Gnosticism, we have a gospel based on what was seen and looked at and touched. Right? So here's my question. Gnosticism aside, why might secret or deeper knowledge or spirituality, I'll add that, be appealing or tempting, right? If I were to say to you, hey, you know, there's something more, right? You don't have all of it. Let me tell you what the Gospel of Thomas says about Jesus, right? Let me tell you about some secret, deeper knowledge, right? 
um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. I have, a, I have brothers and sisters and, and friends uh, in the Pentecostal movement. I've been asked before, have you experienced the baptism of the Spirit? There's something deeper for you. There's something more for you than your original salvation, right? So that's why I put in there even spirituality. And I'm not trying to dog that, bad word from the 80s, but there's a secret deeper knowledge, right? There's another way to do it. Oprah will come on and say, hey, read the book The Secret, right? There's secrets. There's different things that are out there that are deeper than what you can know, right? Um, it's appealing, even if it's weird. This was some weird stuff, right? They had heard it, though, in their platonic thought, but there's something about that that someone says there's more. There's more. You're missing some of it, right? It is not scriptural. Look at what Peter writes. His divine power is granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, Get it? You have all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Okay? It says that you have escaped from the corruption that is in the world. Now, I told you earlier that I was going to try and prove that there might have been Gnostic thought even in the first century, 100 years before this. Um, as you understand church history and you realize that the Holy Spirit used the writers of Scripture in certain time periods and in certain cities, it can open up your understanding of Scripture and what it's trying to teach. Does that make sense? And we do that when we say, hey, this city struggled with these sins. We're used to saying that. The church at Corinth was like this. They struggled with these sins because there was this there. Okay? It also is true of their theology. Paul tells Timothy, O oh, Timothy, and O oh is in the ESV, I looked, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Guard it. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. Okay? One of the older writings in our New Testament. Okay? He also says, The Spirit says that in later times people will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits, teachings of demons, through the insincere, insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, and here is that physical is bad, who forbid marriage, require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who know and believe the truth. Everything created by God is good. Directly against what Gnostic thought would teach, right? goes on. Hebrews 1, right? In the past, God spoke through the prophets... But now in the last days, he's spoken to us through his son, Jesus. But look at what he says. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. This is Christology 101. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the exact representation of the father. So if you think, man, I might have more interest in that Christian life if, I just, if God could just show himself to me. He did. He's Jesus. And we have the writings that tell who Jesus is and what he was like. He's the exact representation. He even goes on there to say some things that would speak to Gnostic thought or would. He became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Keeps going. Second John, right a little bit later. Many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one as the deceiver and the antichrist. Okay, you read, they go, oh, okay, yeah, I sort of get it. These are big questions, right? This is asking, who is Jesus, right? You're, you're, in the, you're in the second century. You may not have the writings written down in front of you, and certain people are teaching certain things, right? We know they're teaching different ways to Jesus, but they're teaching who is he? Was he really man, right? Uh, or was he just pretend? Was he just... Uh, a ghost? Was he really God? Who is God? Is he the God of the Bible or some other person? Was there multiple ones? What's the relationship between Jesus and God? Things that you take for granted because you've, you've sat under good biblical teaching, you've, written your, you've read your Bible, you've had theology books that you've read, whatever it is, you, you, you know these things, right? They didn't have the scriptures in front of them. Uh, and then the follow-up is even what writings are inspired, Okay. Marcion, who's going to develop a different type, a little bit of Gnosticism later, um, chooses his own books of the Bible and even takes out part of the Gospels. You know, he says, this is, these, these are inspired, and it's going, to, 
lead the church into the development of the rule of Scripture or the canon of Scripture and what is inspired. And it started by this Gnostic. I want to show you one more thing. I don't know if you have your Bibles out. If not, I'm just going to read these. These are just some passages out of Colossians that I want to read to you. But I want you to think about somebody teaching falsely about who Jesus is and that Paul is writing this to that church to strengthen their faith. Okay? And I'm just going to jump between these passages. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, the opposite of worldly wisdom. Their prayer is, his prayer is that the church would have spiritual wisdom, right? Verse 12, we give thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So he says there, we were uh, under sin, but Jesus uh, has given us the ability uh, and the efficacy as we accept him to be transferred to a different kingdom. Okay? Look at what even he says. And, and some people believe that this actually became a creed in the early church. Verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Now you're thinking, the people around that church didn't believe that, right? They believed that things were created in a different way. Here, he is saying, no, not only the Father, but the Son existed, and the Son was part of the creation process. Right? It, again, it's, it's directly telling them who Jesus was. Verse 17 says, he's before all things. In him, all things hold together. Clear teaching on Jesus, right? I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. He says in verse 28 that they proclaim Jesus, warning everyone and teaching everyone, look at that term, with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. So as you learn about who Jesus is, you become mature in Christ. Your faith deepens and your maturity deepens, and then it's going to be seen in what you believe. Okay, we're going to continue here. Look at uh, chapter 2, verse 4. I say this, Paul writes, in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Interesting reason for writing them. There's going to be plausible arguments, right? Verse 16, flip down just a little bit, says, Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, right? Look at verse 18. Let no one disqualify you insisting on aestheticism right? A normative response to a platonic way of thinking that the body is bad, right? All of a sudden, we're not, everything is bad that's physical. Um, he says, no. He says, uh, don't let them go on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind, not holding fast to the head, whom through the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with the growth that is from God. Okay. Are you picking up on these things? Right? Verse 23, and I'll end with this there. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Again, it's going to open up the way you read your Bible when you realize what the struggles were around the people. Okay? And again, that some of these things are, are being taught in a sense today. Uh, a couple quotes about um, Marcion, it says he stands out, and this is important, his teaching helped the church formally recognize those books that belong in the New Testament. Okay, again, he removed all the Old Testament references from Luke. Um, he used his abbreviated canon. The early church excommunicated him for doing this. You can't just pick what you want. Uh, it says Marcion's challenge there at the bottom of that quote revealed to the church that a more formal listing of books was needed, lest the apostolic faith be overturned. People just can't pick and choose what they want to believe, right? So I think the slide from Hannah is great. The response of the ancient church or really what happens through them as people say things that aren't true and lead people that aren't true. Three things. There's the doctrine of apostolic secession. Again, we, we said 
being non-Catholic, sometimes we throw this out. Super important, right? They can say, this is what the apostles who were with Jesus taught, and we can trace back these writings and our beliefs to them. And we follow that chain. We're not saying that historical chain is inspired or that there could be, there might be issues with that, right? But we're saying we have that chain. Uh, It also helps development that early creed, right? The church then is going to have something that they're going to say, what are the most important things that are true about Jesus and our faith? And we need to put that into words. And then it's also going to help us develop, or excuse me, the early church develop the canon, right? The books that are in your New Testament. Okay few more things. We just have a few more minutes. I put some things up here. Again, I told you the books are sitting over here. Um, The books over there, I have them from left to right. There's there's a a book that's by Rose Publishing that's a little easier to read with pictures, if you like pictures. (laughs) Then as you go this way, there's Shelley's book, then the first of two by Gonzalez, and then the the book there uh, that is actually the one on the end is John Hanna's Our Legacy. And what he does is he takes the different areas of the church and walks through what did the uh, apostles believe, what did the church fathers believe, what did the apologists believe about baptism. And so he puts them into sections like that. But you're welcome to to look at those. I think they're interesting. I also put up there a podcast I love. It is not in uh, chronological order, so you can go back and pick the ones as you learn your order of church history. It's not in order. um, And then I want you to look at your handouts. So... I want to thank Sherry for not only copying them, but making them different colors for those of us who need that. Uh, what these charts are, are people and events of this era of church history. I'm going to have these blank in certain squares next week, and you have to fill them in. Dates, people, what they did, the facts. So be ready. Don't waste your time. We don't need to be on the internet this week. We can study this. What you see on there is the way that these are described. There's the apostolic fathers. You'll see Polycarp on there. And then it says uh, the writings. So there's Polycarp's epistle to the Philippians. Um, That's that green sheet on top. When you flip it over, we go into the area that we were today. Okay, on the back side of that, and you see Justin Martyr. Again, it says the dates, roughly, that the person lived, where they ministered, and then their writings. Um, And again, uh, these are the ones that... um, Those are the ones that we have copies of. And then some facts about them. Okay, if you love charts, you're going to love these handouts. Okay, flip over to the blue sheet. Okay, we'll go into the next, or I guess the end of the second century, into the third century of what we'd call the church fathers. Okay, if you see the first one there, Irenaeus, that's somebody you need to read. And if you see the work there against heresies, that's specifically his work against Gnostic thought. Phenomenal. Worth reading, right? He's our guy that knew and studied at least some under Polycarp, okay? You'll see some giants of the faith there that you may recognize. The backside is just a, more of that list, what they wrote. Um, then we get into the um, really almost the 300s, the Nicene and post-Nicene fathers. Okay, you may recognize Eusebius, the church historian, Athanasius. You're going, okay, yeah, some of this sounds familiar, But again, you'll see, so if you see Athanasius on there, so we can't cover all of these people, uh, but you can see like orations against the Arians. So then you Google, what was the Arian heresy? What did they believe about Jesus or what was this about? Then you can go read his writing against that. So the reason some of these are called by certain people um, apologists and not fathers is because they responded to doctrinal error in the church or in certain believers specifically. Pretty cool stuff. Okay? you got a lot of things you can read now. Okay? Keep going. That sheet is actually, that chart is, is actually four pages total, front and back of two, the yellow one. Go to the orange one. Some of the doctrinal controversies. See this? I guess, I guess it's salmon. Sorry. It's hard under the lighting. Okay, some of the controversies. Um, and then the conclusions also, but you'll recognize some of the struggles of, again, defining who Jesus is, was he man, was he God, was he both, and you can read some of those works. You can see uh, who the heretic was, who the orthodox person leading the charge against that was, and then you can even see how it played out in the definitions. So you'll see the Nicene Creed, the Chalcedonian Creed uh, 451, you'll see some of those. Again, our creeds, 
that you may have grown up saying out loud in your church, or if you hear of a council, they're in response to heresy a lot of times. We need to define truth because they're saying things that aren't true, okay? And on the back, you'll see a few more heresies, just for some light reading, um, a lot of isms. Uh, again, isms are just falsehoods about Jesus. Uh, more isms on the yellow sheet. Uh, you'll see those there. The interesting thing is, as you study, on the back, and they're on the back of the councils listed, uh, as you study some of those isms, you'll start to recognize these are true today. People have taken their beliefs about who Jesus is, and now we see them in, in people's teaching, whether they are uh, a cult, a recognized large cult, right? As you think of, I had some friends or I knew people who were in this cult, and you could know them by name, like you had a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon, or the, what did they believe about who Jesus was and who God is? Where is their revelation? Where does it come from? Well, we add books. Sound familiar, right? When a Mormon showed up, I said, I would like to have the Pearl of Great Price. I'd like to have your other works, and I'm willing to, I'm willing to read them. Then we're going to talk about these things, and there are other works. There's more that you didn't know, right? And we're the only ones that have truth in this group, right? What we say is read your scriptures, right? Run everything on these sheets through the scriptures, and you'll come to uh, be able to examine the truth on your own, right? The Holy Spirit and God's Word and God's people will lead you to that, okay? Uh, we have two minutes, and then we're going to close by saying a couple of these creeds out loud. Um, I want to make sure... This is a book that, it looks like one of those books you get free when you order from Christian book distributors. It used to be CBD. They don't call it that anymore, christianbook.com now for obvious reasons. But this is a great book on uh, how uh, the Da Vinci Code, but specifically Gnosticism, has entered culture. And he answers questions about these texts. Uh, Daryl Bach is a professor at DTS at Dallas Seminary, and he, he, but he walks through, what about when someone says that that should have been true, but this isn't true? Okay, great book. You're welcome to borrow it. Any questions? And then we'll have to go brief. Keith. The first Gnostic was Satan. <laughs> okay, that's brief. Yeah. Uh, if you eat of this, I love it. If you eat of this tree of good and evil, you will be revealed to you the real facts that God is withholding from you, and you will be a God yourself, and you'll have all the secrets that he's withholding right. from you now. Right. So I love it. I'm going to get a T-shirt made of it. <laughs> um, at the same time, Gnostics would say, we can see in the story of the fall that the God of the Old Testament didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> right? Specifically in that, in that instance. Yes? Rich Mullins does a great song on the Apostles' Creed. Yes, he does. Third yes, he does. Mm -hmm. Both. <laughs> Anything else stand out or any questions for tonight? Communion, baptism, the other church gathering, being in community? Well, I think what stands out is when you look through these sheets, so many people spend their life refuting heresy. And I think sometimes for me... I'm all about, oh, let's, let's love people. But truth is so important. And I don't know, it's just when we see truth being eroded, we do need to stand up for it. It That's is right. important. It's vitally important um, vitally. that we maintain orthodoxy. And they weren't lazy. Mm -hmm. Right? The, these things were important enough that they um, considered spending their time doing it. So, mm -hmm. okay. What I want to do right now is... There are actually creeds and hymns in your New Testament. Some of them, you'll notice when you read, are in paragraph form. Right? Quotes are usually in all caps. So when you see all, everything in all caps, that's a quote in the Old Testament. But there are also creeds and hymns that we see inside there. Okay, I'm going to show you a couple, and then we're going to say these out loud. So Ephesians 4, right, in the bold. There's one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Right? That was actually, they, they believed that was actually a hymn that was sang, right? Another one, the end of Timothy. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed amongst the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Might not have ever noticed these, right? Sometimes they'll say, 
as the person wrote or as we say. Most of the times they don't. Um, one of the oldest ones, and that has, has been traced back to um, uh, being a very old creed, uh, as Paul says when he writes the church at Corinth, this is what we consider a first importance. And what's a first importance? It's what we made into a creed because it's so important. And then the Holy Spirit speaks it through Paul that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. He was buried, raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Right? Creeds. And then we have this one as well. So we're going to try and read all four of these as we close. I know we're a little bit late, so um, why don't you guys stand up? Put on your best high church, speak with other people voices if you grew up in that. We're not going to sing them. Okay? And I will lead us. We're doing what's in bold. There is one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. That He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. That He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. You want chills, right? Your spiritual great-great-great-great-great-grandparents were saying these words. Okay? You're connected to them. One more. I believe in God the Father Almighty and in Christ Jesus, His only begotten Son, our Lord, who was born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, who under Pontius Pilate was crucified and buried, in the third day rose from the dead, ascended unto the heavens, and sat at the right hand of the Father, from whence He shall come to judge the living and the dead, and in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, the remission of sins, and the resurrection of the flesh. Amen. We're dismissed.